Are you ready to stop the self-sabotage and create the life you desire? Well, in order for that to happen, you need to break free from the bad beliefs that are holding your success hostage. You need to optimize the stress by turning it into extra energy for success. And those hurtful habits? Well, we need to give that pain a purpose for progress. Welcome to Stop the Self-Sabotage and Create the Life You Desire podcast. I'm trying to get comfortable. So, I have a question for the CHs that have decided to join us, Al and Kimberly. What comes to mind when you think of somebody's shadow? Maybe you've heard the term before, maybe you haven't, but what comes to mind when we talk about aspects of the personality being shadow? What do you think that symbolizes? What I'm dealing with uh, lately have been clients who have uh, issues that that are difficult to resolve. Um, I had a client who would sit there during a hypnosis session and have this really serious anger facial feature through a good part of what we were covering. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, I ended up asking if I could talk to that part of her. And it ended up being that she was mad because of her childhood and everything else that was addressed there. And I told her that her anger is killing her and that she needs to do something. We need to do something different. And I thought it, it just blew me away because she made this comment. She goes, well, if I get rid of the anger, what will I replace it with? And, and, and it was like, <laughs> and, and when she was, when she was uh, conscious, she doesn't remember saying this. Okay. Right. So two days later, her son stays out to midnight on a, a weekday night. He comes home. He's used to her just tearing her up. And, and so he's crying when he walks in the door because he's afraid of what's going to happen. Right. She explains to him, I was worried about you. I tried calling you. You're grounded from electronics and communications till next Monday. And we'll talk about it tomorrow if we have to. And she walked away. A complete different change from who she normally was. And that shadow, I think, is that part of her personality that was kind of like running a show but wasn't exactly upfront and obvious. So yes, the shadow was the part that was running the show that she wasn't consciously aware of. And so it held great potential and great energy that wasn't being utilized because it was going to come out no matter what, right? Right, right. Yeah, you nailed it. Kimberly, what does the shadow mean to you? Alter ego just popped in my head. Um, to me, it's working with your demons. Okay. And, and if anger is something that we've never been taught how to handle, that could be a demon, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what would come out whenever her son would show up late, breaking curfew, mm-hmm. the, the, the demon would come out how about this how about the shadow being parts of our personality that are actually good and we've repressed them they could actually be an area of our brilliance why would we repress something that we would be good at self-doubt yeah, self sabotage for progress. What if we were an excellent athlete and we we actually were came from a family of athletes and we were superseding any of the the history or the legacy that our family already had in place? And what if our father was a coach? And now the father 
is getting concerned because the child's getting ready, ready to beat the father's records and there's something else going on. The father isn't sure that he can continue coaching the child at the level that they're going to need. So the child can actually hold back one of their strengths, talents, and abilities and shove it into the shadow because it's not that brilliance is threatening to outshine someone in their world and they know that it's not going to bode well for that authority figure. So they decide to repress it and suppress it. So it's not always demons, but yet that suppression and repression, as you were both saying, can wind up running the show because now we've got this pent up energy. How's it going to show up at? Amber Bill supervising MFC. So Angie, it's so great that you were able to join us. So good to be here. We were just discussing. What's the shadow? So what's the shadow to you when you hear somebody talk about ego aspects that are the shadow? What do you think of? Um, first of all, sorry I'm late. Um, second, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Better late than never. That's right. I, I, I think of it as the, the parts of ourselves that we reject, that we don't want to accept about ourselves, And yeah. That's it. You, you got it right there. It is some aspect of us. It doesn't matter if it's negative, positive, good, bad, pain, progress, that for whatever reason was deemed unacceptable by society. And then we pull it in and then we say our culture and then we pull it in and we say our community and then we pull it in, and then we say our family, and then we pull it in, and then we say us. So all of those layers, it could, it, it could have been something outstanding. It could have been something that we just didn't have the skill set at the time to be able to manage, and it was deemed unacceptable. So we suppressed it, and we repressed it. But it's not gone, is it? No. <laughs> I, no, I just, I just talked to a client the other day, and um, she's a pharmacist, and um, was was basically not working as a pharmacist. She had a baby, and 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 uh, wanting to get back. As we as we talked to her when she was under, she she brought up the situation of being in at, at Metro High School in St. Louis. And all the kids that, would, that were there were going to these Ivy League schools when they graduated and everything else. And she stayed in town and went to SLU and everything. And her comment was that she didn't think she was Metro material. Okay? And, and that Metro material mindset kind of ran through much of what she, uh, her attitude when it came to herself, her doubt of herself, her, her limiting her options and everything else, it was something that was there and it just kind of hung around even though she had succeeded and showed the ability to go way beyond any of those issues that she had. Yeah, so she had no idea that Metro material identity, that sub-aspect of her personality is running any other achievement that she might experience. And so she can have these great accolades of what she's allowed to happen in her life, and she is going to dumb them down because they don't meet the Metro criteria. Mm-hmm. Or that, there's that self-doubt believing that, she, that it was a fluke, that, that sooner or later somebody's going to figure her out or see the truth. Imposter syndrome. Right. Oh my gosh, imposter syndrome is, what if they discover, uh, discover the truth about me and, and, and find out that I'm a fake? Yes, and then we do all sorts of actions to cover up the fact that we feel like a fake, and it just continues then to reinforce Metro material. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not Metro material. Okay. Mm-hmm. Carl Jung is the one that coined the term the shadow aspect or the shadow self. And it was his belief that anything we suppressed and repressed that we did not allow ourselves to experience would hold a great deal of power over us and that we would not be able to see it because it was in our shadow behind us. If you think of the sun coming at Mm -hmm. us and the shadows behind us, so we can't actually see what's behind us, but it would be like the boogeyman looming over us and it would have the ability to control us. Using, utilizing hypnosis is one of the ways that we can talk to the shadow directly and we can find out why was it wounded because for someone to suppress and repress that means something about them was not acceptable and so what did they have to hold back and because they were holding back now they're wounded so what was what was the wound But as I like to say, the wound holds wealth because this aspect of their personality has a tremendous amount of power and energy. And it can either use it to continue to try to do pain avoidance because Al was saying uh, with his Metro material, isn't it better to, to put yourself down before someone else does it? Because if you're going to inflict pain, at least if you do it to yourself, you know how much you're going to have versus someone else who could do more than what you can handle. So the shadow will do pain avoidance by saying, I'll do it to myself because at least that way I can control how much I'm going to hurt. Which sounds wild, but we do it all the time. (laughs) So it's, it's going to be the wound, but the wound holds tremendous wealth. It controls the ability to move into progress by saying, well, if we can control pain, we can also control how we're going to be perceived moving forward, but no longer by an outside influence how we're going to perceive ourselves. It takes the control, it takes the authority away from outside influences, other people that inflict that original wound and it puts the power back in the person. And to do that, we typically use parts therapy. So I've been talking a whole hoop and bunch. What, What comments do you guys have at this point? What do you want to add? What clients have you worked with where, where you've done this and they've experienced pretty incredible results? I mean, I, I, am I muted or no? No, you're good, Angie. Go for it. Like this is, to me, the cornerstone of everything, because if we, like you said, the wound has great wealth in it, because if it's like, if we're identifying as a person who is a piece of shit or whatever, you know, fill in the blank, um, that people feel, should feel sorry for us or somehow we're playing the victim part, you know, feel sorry for me. We all do that. Sure um, we do. It's once we can really like pivot that and start seeing ourselves as worthy and deserving and capable and lovable and you know all of that well heck everything's going to start to shift so to me this is this is where i like to spend a lot of my time with clients mm-hmm. to hypnosis is switching that it's in the solar plexus that imposter syndrome thing you know like mm-hmm. thinking that we're not good and Feelings repressed never die. They just get stronger. There's a book called that. Feelings repressed never die. Have you heard that book? I have not heard of that one. Yeah. Feelings repressed never die. They, they just get stronger. Um, so 
and I've had great success with this. People just, I mean, everything changes, you know, when they start to change this part of themselves or whatever identity is that that part that's telling them that there's something unacceptable about themselves or flawed, Mm -hmm. you know, I know that's generic, but there's so many different cases of that. And and it happens as Al was sharing with with his case earlier that you came in on part of the way through, Angie. Um, and and Al, if you want to reiterate how it just happened for her normally and naturally, being able to upgrade the way she did. Which which one? The first one, first case. Um, the one with the son. Son, yeah, yeah. She, I mean, she she ended up. We dealt with with. The, this anger, which was was constant uh, in her life, and she was starting to get aggressive toward strangers and everything else. And and we we gave her a choice. I dealt with the anger part, and gave her a choice to to learn how to deal with it differently. And not only was she able to to not blow up at her son, but she she was able to go back and talk to her mom to try to get some resolution over her childhood, how she was treated. She talked to her dad and, and, and uh, some other people who had some negative impacts on her life and, and was able to forgive them or get past that. So she makes the comment, and, and last time we had met, she goes, this will be the first time in my life where I think I can actually be happy. And I'm thinking, this is really bizarre. That, that something is as simple and, and small as this ends up having such a snowballing effect. Yeah, we can, it, because it seems simple to us as hypnotists mm-hmm. to do parts mm-hmm. therapy. Mm-hmm. And, to, and not all hypnotists do it. We just all happen to be trained in it. Kimberly mm-hmm. happens to be learning it as we speak. <laughs> but, so to us, yes, it does seem simple. But when you give somebody permission to be who they are, you're right, Al. It begins to pick up progress. And where's the next area and the next area and the next area? Because it's looking for um, the subconscious mind always seeks the next challenge. Mm -hmm. And if there's not a next challenge, then it'll start sabotaging itself to give it something to do. (laughs) So... Mm -hmm. She automatically picked that up. Jung found that we will project our shadow onto people around us. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, all you have to do is go on social media right now and see all the finger pointing. (laughs) You are wrong. You are doing this. You are doing that. And psychology brain science married together whenever they started studying mirror neurons so a mirror neuron says that in our mind in our in our brain something cannot fire off unless we already possess the ability for it and i'll give you my favorite example i'm watching the news And they're talking back-to-back stories about two people. One had hurt a small child and another one had hurt a puppy. And I'm going, I don't get that. How can you hurt something defenseless like that? I just, I don't get it. And then the next morning on the news, they had a story about this couple who had a 30-something-year-old son that was still living in their basement, refusing to go get a job. They couldn't get him out, so they actually had to go to court to a victim. And I'm going, I could so get that. (laughs) I relate to that. Well, why couldn't I relate to the abuse of children or or animals? Because I don't possess that ability. Why could I relate to the parents telling their kids, enough is enough, get the freak out? I possess that ability. So when we see something in someone else that we, not that we don't get it, but that we do get it, and we give such a severe judgment on it, it's behavioral science is telling us we possess that ability ourselves. 
So a lot of times clients will come in because they're experiencing challenges like the anger, overeating. So the weight has gotten completely out of control um, because a lot of times we'll eat our emotions. There's suppression and repression. They're eating that identity to try to get it down. But then as the client begins to explain the situation they're in, they'll start bringing up characters in the story that they feel are holding them back, but they may also be projecting some of their own pain onto that person and using them as a character to fill in from the original imprint. So we have the imprint that caused the wound and now we will continue to seek out a cast of characters to fill in the different positions in the play of our life that mimic the original hurt. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jung was just absolutely brilliant on this. So he said there, there were a few things that we want to watch for in working with our clients. Now, we are not psychologists or psychiatrists, but we are coaches with our hypnosis. Although, Al, you are a therapist. <laughs> we look at how to take somebody's pain and move it into progress. So we want to be aware of some of these projections that our clients can bring to us and be thinking to ourselves, have, do they possess this ability themselves and have they picked a player in this movie of their life to act out what they're not owning themselves? Because Jung said he'd rather be whole than good, which he was explaining he'd rather accept the parts of his shadow and understand he holds those capabilities himself because then when he owns the his shadow aspects, he controls them. But if he keeps projecting them onto other people, he'll never have the power to do anything with his life. So, uh, the first one was, let me get to it. Okay, a tendency to harshly judge others especially if the judgment is an impulse judgment. So this is not discernment. Discernment says what you're doing is not healthy for me. I need to have boundaries. I need to be able to say, you know what, you can do that all you want, but you're not going to do it around me. So it's not discernment. This is when we're making somebody wrong. And it's typically making somebody wrong because they don't meet standards. We can see how somebody's dressed. I know um, BC, before COVID, one of the uh, leaders of one of our prayer groups in church had to make a, an announcement uh, that, yes, some of the young ladies that were coming into our church maybe weren't dressed the way you would think somebody would need to be dressed for coming to church. Instead, they looked like they were going out clubbing. And he said, I've heard the comments from some of you. But I want you to think of this. Maybe these are the very people who need to be here. So they were being judged harshly. They were being criticized because they didn't meet those norms. Remember how we talked about society and culture and family? Each one of those layers has a set of rules. Now, rules can either be boundaries that can bless us or they can have rules that will restrict the life out of anything. So we want to look at, are they very impulsive with their emotions? Going back to Al, when he talked about the woman losing her temper, 
that that tells us that there there could be a shadow aspect there that need, needs to be addressed and what we're doing is we're just projecting the fact if if we're criticizing people a lot well our original wound could have been there was a lot of criticism and we've got we've got to own the fact that we're projecting it onto other people making them wrong because it's simply mirroring the fact of how often we were made wrong on yeah I'm just just have a question okay i'm trying to follow um because you were talking about how you said that we have to possess the ability ourselves and you gave the examples of you don't have that within you to harm a puppy or a small child or whatever um and but then then the other one that you did you know like the child living in the basement um and you could judge that person harshly right in the first case of the person who you can't, you don't possess the ability because it's not really in your experience. Um, we're still judging them harshly because it's like it's, it's it, to me it's above and beyond harsh judgment. It's like can't even relate to this person. Relate to the word, yeah. Yeah, relate. There's discernment. The, okay, that that this is going against some sort of morality and values. Mm-hmm. So this, there's a discernment that cannot be allowed. In the case of the puppy and the child? Abuse, yeah. Okay. Cause I guess I'm trying to figure out how this all fits, how this all weaves together. Um, so if I, if I can be the parent that could easily evict a child, what's the other side of that? The, the, someone that couldn't. That, that would enable them and they would let them stay. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, I could be the child that needs to be evicted. Oh, okay. As soon as I say on the dynamics of, I, I understand why parents could do that. Mm-hmm. I also have the dynamic of being the child that would need to be evicted. That could be part of my shadow. Mm-hmm. Where am I slacking? Where, where am I um, not living up to my potential? Where am I having to be forced to move into something? So that could be a shadow aspect. Whenever you look at something, let's look at the whole and go, well, yeah, I get the parents. Well, then that also means that you have to be able to get the child. Well, isn't it kind of like that, the, the concept that, that the things that we see that aggravate our, 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 the things that others that aggravate us the most, we often possess. Yes. Yes. Right? What I'm trying to understand, like the context. So you said there's two things. The imprint, um, do they possess the ability themselves? The yes. second one, have they picked out a character to play the shadow part? right? Have they projected onto a character? Yes. Two questions that you're asking, right? Yes. Yes. But what's the context before that? Like, what, why are we asking those two questions to determine what? Okay. So if you've got somebody coming in and they're the victim all the time and they need to get out of that victim mentality mm-hmm. and they keep talking about a bully in their life. Okay. What are they not owning up to that they can do? Not be the victim anymore. But, but what's the shadow? The shadow isn't the victim. That's full on the surface. Bully. Bully. Exactly. So they could possess the ability of being a bully. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So let's tap into, hey, When you're doing parts therapy, so the victim shows up, and then you can say, now I want to know what's on the other side of the victim. What's behind the victim? Tell me who's there. So basically, these questions are to try to help someone identify the shadow. Yes, but but doing it in a hypnotic state. Okay, so not just identify the shadow. Let's bring the shadow out and let's work with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Because do you think there would be a time in somebody's life when they should be a bully? 
Sure. Most definitely. But they haven't been able to because they've been so stuck in the victim side. Mm -hmm. There needs to be times whenever we do manipulate people in situations who are trying to harm us and we manipulate them right out of the situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that from the victim. They haven't owned the bully that's in the shadow. Right, right. Okay. Did that clear up your question, yeah. Angie? Yeah. yeah, I just, yeah. Thank you. Al, anything you want to add to that? No, no, that's good. No complaints. Kimberly, no complaints. any questions? No. Okay. So then, number two, pointing out our insecurities as flaws in another. Well, I wouldn't have to do this if they wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have to lose my temper if my kid would come home at a correct time. I wouldn't have to um, eat nothing but junk food if whenever I purchased healthy food, my roommates would stay away from it. Worked with that one just not too long ago. So we'll point out that we can't move forward because of someone else. Our clients can't move forward because of someone else. So what's in the shadow? Because at the surface is pain. What's in the shadow? What part of them is hiding? If they're projecting their insecurities. Right. Wherever the insecure part is. Yeah. The person who, the person who in their true desires wouldn't mind bullying somebody if they could get away with it. The strong part. The yeah. part that says, I can move forward. The part says that I can do this. I'm not insecure. Let's make it happen. That can be in the shadow. So the shadow is not always made up of, of things that hold us down. Our shadow can be made up of some very powerful energy that will move us forward. But oh my gosh, what happens when we don't project our insecurity on someone else. We have to take responsibility, 100% responsibility for ourselves. That's the biggest problem I had in my first marriage. I had a scapegoat as long as I could point my finger at somebody and go, well, you're the problem. (laughs) (laughs) Poor man never had a chance with me. (laughs) So we have to take 100% responsibility for our insecurities, for our own flaws, and for the fact that we need to develop a skill set to at least make it all manageable. Now, what have you had as far as an experience whenever you're working with your clients and you tell them, okay, this is... This is what we need to do to move forward. And you're asking them to take ownership of those insecurities and and finding a way to manage them. What do clients usually tell you? Are they all excited about doing that or, or are they finding excuses on why they can't and how do you handle it? And with with the, I'm just I'm sticking with the two that are, uh, with my pharmacist, who didn't think she was metro material, she would it, it really became one of those things where she was consumed by a lot of self doubt. Mm-hmm. She you know it was wasn't until we started really working at that did we did she start to acknowledge that the people around her that were supposed to be supportive weren't being supportive and that she needed to kind of step up and start 
leaning and, and developing the skills within herself. So if they ever do step up, that's great. But if they don't, she's going to be sufficient. Now, it sounds like on that, she was probably pretty excited about learning how to support herself in that area. Or did she, oh, did she balk at yeah, it? Was a, it, was, it was a trip and a half. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she would come in with, uh, she would have slippers on, pajama pants, and she'd bring in a dinosaur blanket. And, and we, would, she would, we would sit down and we'd have a list of things that we were going to address. And she sometimes she'd text me and sometimes we'd talk for about 15 minutes before we do it. But then she'd go under and, and, and it was like every other session we've had, it's been a hypnosis session and she's used the hypnosis as a means to really kind of restructure her mindset and her own personal perspective. It's, it's been amazing. It was really kind of cool. And I'm so glad in the therapy that you do, because you see clients that the rest of us do not, because they might have some stronger issues that need to be worked with utilizing the therapy and the hypnosis. And I just think it's phenomenal how you've married the two of those together to be able to move clients forward faster. Mm-hmm. How much time do you think you've saved and, and just therapy and, and therapy utilizing hypnosis for this one client, just her as an example? Oh, oh her alone, we we're, we would probably be looking at like six months to a year. And, 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 and I had a client come in uh, who was just a basket case, just crying, really, really upset. And the, I go, and I scheduled a hypnosis session within two days afterwards. And she came back in. We did the hypnosis session, and her life's back on keel. And I'm still seeing her, but it's it's dealing with things from a very focused and secure position. And and that would not have happened if if we stayed with traditional counseling. It would have taken months to get there. See, what you just shared is a great reminder for the rest of us of the, the power of this tool that we're using. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, it, and what's neat is, 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 you know, and I'm sure the, the rest of you do, is, is I really impress upon them that they're in control of this, that they're creating the, the environment, they're creating the scenarios on how to resolve the issues. All I'm doing is kind of giving them some subtle direction and, and so, so when, and I tell them even before we do any sessions, that the solutions they're finding are theirs and they're theirs to control and manipulate. So you don't have to keep coming back to me for help. Yes. So transfer of authority, transfer mm-hmm. of power that says right. we create the experience. What they do with the experience is up to, up to them. It's up to them. Right. Mm-hmm. There we go. Ah, yes. Okay. Number three, uh, having a temper with people when they're in positions that are lower than ours. So we'll use power over another person as a way for compensating when we feel helpless. So if someone's coming in and, and they're having challenges with anger management. Well, what happened where they were victimized? What happened where they felt helpless? Because the anger is simply a coping mechanism that tries to fill in the crack around that hopelessness. Can you read the first part, though? You said having a temper with people who are what? In a position uh, uh, that is less... Th- Uh, authority than ours subordinate okay so you don't see where they get angry up they get angry down okay so what's on the other side of that 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 helplessness hopelessness where we feel like there's nothing we can do that will ever make a difference it's going to continue to stay this way that can be the part that's in the shadow. 
uh, the trauma triangle. Trauma drama. So we've got the victim, but to be the victim, but if we're going to have a victim, there has to be a bully. And victim and bully, there is too much intensity between just those two. We will always bring in a third person or a third entity to be able to diffuse some of that energy. And that's when we bring in the hero. We see it all the time um, with parents, husband and wife are not getting along. And it gets too intense between the two of them. And they're not doing anything to develop their skill set to be able to find a resolution to that intensity. So what happens? One of the kids start acting out. The kid is actually playing the hero in this situation because the child's saving their parents from each other because now they're no longer focused on tearing each other apart. They've got to focus on this problem child. But in doing so, at some point, the hero will be made into the victim because people, as victims get tired of being saved Mm -hmm. and they get ticked off at their heroes. And so now the hero becomes the victim and the victims become the bully and everybody starts moving around positions. So the trauma drama triangle on that, it's just getting them off of it. Personal responsibility. Why do you feel a need to pull in these people to fill all these other roles for you? How about just recognize that you have the ability to have all these roles yourself, and it's okay at times to be a victim. There are things that are going to happen in our life we have no complete control over. There are times when it's okay to bully and manipulate somebody to get them out of your world. And it's okay at times to save people when they don't have the ability to save themselves. But we choose to step into those roles. It's not being chosen for us through our shadow. Any questions or comments? Okay. How about we celebrate how phenomenal we are? We are great. Yes, we're celebrating. But we don't bring up the fact that we've had to step on other people to do that. That will happen. I remember uh, being at a family member's uh, a party for a family member who had achieved a great deal of success. It, all right. It was one of my sisters. <laughs> When I showed up for the party, the people that were there were in absolute shock because she had told many of them, there were only a couple of close friends, she had told many of them she was an orphan. So for the family to show up, me and my mom, boy, that was a surprise, okay? And they were talking about this phenomenal success that she had, that she was a self-made millionaire. And I'm thinking back to all the sacrifices my mom and dad did to give her a start for her to be where she wanted to be. And there's no one that's self-made. We all have people that we've, that we've worked with. We all have people that we've used, used at times. But that can be in the shadow because we don't want to admit that at times we have violated our own values to get where we need to be. And if we don't understand that, then our ability or our shadow's ability to have us continue to violate our values will hold control over us. I'm sorry, but but I need to go. Yes, we're almost done. So, all right, Al, go get to your next client and you'll get the audio on it. Okay. Okay. So just keep in mind that we can partner with people, but what's on the other side of partnering with them? It's using them. Then we have 
the, the very last one that we'll cover is biases and prejudices. We all have what's known as a cognitive. John, is this number five? Like was number four the. So we had tendency to harshly judge others on impulse. Number two is pointing out our securities as flaws in another. Then number three, having a quick temper, but with people that are in lower positions than us. Number four was the drama trauma triangle. Woo! Number five was a willingness to use others. And number six is unacknowledged biases and prejudices. Cognitive bias says that you'll notice things that you already agree with. You go on social media and you'll notice in your feed the things that you already agree with in a positive progress manner. You'll also notice things in your feed that you have a belief is wrong. If it's neutral, you ain't going to notice it because the subconscious always operates on emotion. It looks to have emotion turned on. There's the challenge. The shadow is running us through emotion instead of us choosing the, the meaning of the emotions. That's how we help somebody upgrade is we give new meaning to those emotions. So we all have biases and we all have prejudices. The ones that are a challenge are the ones that we pretend do not exist. Okay. When we put a belief of some sort of higher power in place and strive for that ideal, strive to say we'll never be perfect, but our higher power believes that we can always have progress. When we put that as one of our defining values, it has been found, uh, psychologically speaking, that we can be more open to progress for everybody involved. But when we put the idea that not of a higher power that says always strive for progress, not perfection, when we put perfection in a person as the idea that we strive for, that is when the shadow takes control. Because we're looking for perfection that can never take place and will project on others how they are missing the mark on the, on the perfection. And that's when we, instead of, start, instead of dealing with guilt that, hey, we let ourselves down, we deal with shame that we miss the mark of perfection. And this can be very dangerous because when people have an ide ideology of perfection of a person that they're striving for, they will shame everyone that misses the mark on that perfection. They will say, it's not just who you are now and what you're doing. We're going to go into your past 20, 30 years and we're going to dredge up stuff and go, look, you, 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 you weren't doing it right even back then. And this is an ideology that leads to people controlling others through shame because they're looking for perfection in a person instead of progress that, we're, that we all want. We're never going to be perfect. Don, this reminds me of that cancel culture thing we talked about before, somewhat. 
this is cancel culture, yeah. Angie. Yeah. This is the reason why it's so dangerous. They're not looking at moral values and objectives that all of us are going to miss the mark on, but we're still going to work towards it. Instead, they're going, no, you're not perfect. You're canceled. And right. they're insecure. Everything we've talked about in the shadow, they're projecting out onto society and government and everything else. Mm-hmm. And this is the reason why they're so dangerous is because they have an ideology of something that never can be ad- obtained. Right. And there was somebody and not too long ago past that did this very thing and tried to come up with a perfect race. Mm-hmm. And that was the Nazis. Mm-hmm. And so that type of ideology, not that moral values guide us, but that a perfect person should be what we're trying to obtain is the shadow running things. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm it glad does. you brought that up. Yeah. Because you've experienced cancel culture. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I just have to tell a little story. I don't know where it's yes. coming from. Um, someone was telling me the other day how there's this movie out there or there's some sort of, I don't know if it's a movie or a series or something where the people are on this planet and they're all used to taking drugs. If they have any sort of negative emotions, you know, you know, I mean, it's like sort of taking pills right now to (laughs) not too far from reach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But here it's acceptable. Like there. And so this, this couple's having a conversation and, and she's feeling kind of down and he's like, well, did you take your pink pill, you know, or whatever? And she's like, Oh, I think I forgot it. And he's like, you better go take your pink pill. And um, like everybody's sort of flatline, like everybody's got to stay positive and all that. And, um, and I think I, I really appreciated this story because I thought, oh my gosh, I so love my shadow because I would not want a reality in which it's not okay to have all these varying emotions. And, you know, like it makes life so much more interesting that's the richness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the texture and, and the aromas and the flavors of our experience all come through contrast. Right. And the it would only be way- so terrible if we it all had it like this, you know? Because the shadow is what gives us the contrast. Yeah. Yeah. And there are times. So we're not asking the shadow to get better. We're asking the shadow to understand its job description and when it should come out. Because we suppress, like our our shadow could be our fun part, like you, like a fun part or or a um, strong part or whatever. It has been suppressed because somehow it's been shamed and, you know, it's it's like, yeah. Yeah, like when cancel culture showed up and tried to tell you not to have a voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. It's, okay. The, it's the, the variety of voices. Is if everybody's voice sounded the same, that would be an awful concert. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. If they only played one instrument. Okay. No variety in that. So, yes, you're right. We need to embrace our shadow. We need to love it. And that's one of the things that we do through hypnosis for our clients is we help them realize how to utilize their shadow in a way that is going to be to their best benefit. Okay. So as we begin to wrap it up, the idea is to create the space for our clients to access their shadow and then utilize it in a way that's going to be their very best instead of projecting it onto other people. But to do that, the shadow needs to be given a job description. When should it be triggered? When should it show up? What should it do when it's triggering, being triggered and showing up? And all of that we do through our parts therapy. So Angie, for people who are going to be listening to this on the podcast, and they decide that they might want to work with you, how can they contact you? HarmonyHarbor.com. Okay. H-A-R-M-O-N-Y Harbor, H-A-R-B-O-R. They can also email me at Angie at HarmonyHarbor.com. All right. And John, real quickly, is there a book or something that you are pulling this stuff from that you'd recommend, like Carl Jung or 
Something? Okay, getting into Carl's stuff, it, I'm going to tell you, I can read a little bit and then I'm going, I got to go take a break for right, a while. Right, right. Okay? okay. There was a, a woman that was able to take this and present it in such a way that was so phenomenal. And her name was Debbie Ford. Oh, okay. She was the pioneer in shadow work. Here's what's interesting. She held these massive workshops and, and trainings on shadow work and said, okay, you know, we need to reach out to the collective and ask for help. We need to be transparent with our shadow and get assistance from others because the shadow is not something that can be tackled on its own. And then Debbie was diagnosed with cancer mm. and hid it from everyone oh. until she passed. Mm. And right before she passed, she made it known that she she had cancer and it wasn't long after that she transitioned. So we saw her shadow at work. Okay. Um, but yes, any of her, she, she was my first teacher on shadow work and I all of her stuff will stand the test of time okay. I, I recommend looking into her information but know that she had her own shadow <laughs> and it showed up yeah. <laughs> in, a, in, in a way that some would consider dysfunctional but that did not negate her work no at all mm -mm. okay so good question Angie Kimberly I know at some point, you're going to be working with clients. Do you have um, a way that you want them to contact you if they decide they, they might want to investigate working with you uh, yet? Do you have any contact numbers? I do. My email would be oh. kimberinc at svcglobal.net. Okay. So, Kimber, can you spell that for us? It's K-I-M-B-E-R-I-N-K at sbcglobal.net, S-B-C-G-L-O-B-A-L-N-E-T. Excellent. So that way, any of my podcasters, if they decide that they want to reach out to either myself, Al's already go gone, um, or either the two of you, whoever is listening to this, I highly recommend you have someone work with you in your shadow because it offers a wealth of energy to move you forward into progress. And so uh, allow these experts and specialists to move you forward in a way, like Al was saying, that can take off not just weeks, but months on being able to achieve. Goddesses, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes. All right. And look for your email that's going to give you the download of our recording today. Okay. Got it. Bye.